Good evening and welcome to Sana's Foundation's discussion uh, on this new book, which has been launched by VIF. It's indeed a pleasure to welcome all of you here today for this uh, uh, interesting discussion. Yeah. I'm Abhinav Pandya, CEO of Sana's Foundation, and uh, it's sure. a real privilege and honor for us yeah, to organize yeah. this discussion. No. My rule is very brief here just to uh, open the session, yeah, so I won't take much of your time. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome all the eminent participants today, uh, which include uh, the eminent members, uh, panelists Dr. James M. Dorsey, Dr. Michael Barak, Dr. N. Janardhan, uh, and General Rakesh Sharma, uh, Dr. Wail Ahmed, Professor K. P. Vijayalakshmi, Dr. Kinshuk Chatterjee. Yes, okay. and we have some special guests today. We have General uh, Raj Shukla, who is the member of UPSC. So I would really like to thank him for joining us today. Then we have Ambassador Rajpurohit, Prakash Rajpurohit, who is joining us from MEA today uh, for an opening uh, remark session. Uh, besides us, yes, okay. so we will just uh, start the session. What I want to say is that uh, this book is a very interesting initiative by VIF uh, and I've been uh, long associated with VIF. I've been writing for VIF regularly and I really appreciate uh, their work in the field of uh, raising awareness about the global issues. So, uh, this interesting book also marks the beginning or, or rather I would say India's unique attempt uh, to uh, uh, at least discuss about what's happening in the world of international affairs at an academic level at a narrative level. Someone a few days back um, in a conference, which was the most on, on West Asia only, asked me a question, how, sh how should be India's participation in the future conflicts and the global geopolitics? My answer was very different. I said that our participation should be guided by our traditions, our state traditions and spread craft, which are firmly rooted in our spiritual traditions. And I answered that India should participate exactly the way uh, Yogeshwar Krishna participated in the participated in the Battle of Mahabharata. He was there, yet he was not there, and he took a very principled and a firm stand, which is what India has been doing in most of the global conflicts. And India's role in the Middle East also, I see in that manner only, India has been able to cultivate excellent relationship uh, with the various countries like Israel, Saudi Arabia, UAE, under the regime and the leadership of Prime Minister Modi. And uh, it is indeed our extended neighborhood which uh, makes the major impact on India's uh, domestic affairs and international affairs. With this, uh, I will just I'll invite uh, uh, Ambassador Raj Purohit to make some opening remarks here. Uh, Ambassador Raj Purohit, I have are you here? Have you joined? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Uh, uh, very. Thank you so much evening. for joining us. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, very good evening to all of you, Mr. Pandya. Thank you for uh, the Vivekanand Foundation for inviting me uh, today uh, for this very valuable discussion on, on this important book released by Ambassador uh, Trigunayat. Our condolences on the demise of his uh, father-in-law. Uh, uh, I was informed today only. Uh, I find this is a very useful uh, compilation of uh, uh, the thoughts uh, from very eminent writers here uh, in, in a nutshell, uh, giving a lot of food of th food for thought on the regional dynamics, the unfolding scenario, the role of various players uh, in going in, 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 in different ways here. Uh, I see that uh, it has been given a lot of uh, contemporary touch and a lot of effort has been made uh, in bringing together everything in a nutshell. I served in the region for more than a decade now, starting from, uh, from Egypt to UAE to uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and as ambassador in Iraq. Uh, and again in this desk, uh, I, we, I have lived in the region uh, in the time of Arab Spring, which is like a decade, 2009-10, if we go a little back. This was a spring or a summer or a winter. We, we really don't know. But after uh, uh, 12 years, uh, we see a lot of turmoil. We see a lot of turbulence, violence, loss of life all across the region. My own experience of interacting with the people around is that people fondly recall the time before the Arab Spring or winter or whatever you call, they they relate their life 
to the life, uh, you know, the living conditions, the law and order, the economy, everything uh, before the all these developments of uh, the war years and revolution and whatever terminology have been given. So uh, uh, this is a broad trend. Uh, I see that people have disenchanted with the so-called uh, uh, the new regimes in different forms and all different value systems and all. Uh, so they want to go back to the financial crisis. Then came the uh, dynamics of the oil prices. There are a long time of you know uh, subdued prices of oil. Then the cell revolution came and finally, you know, this trust on the renewable energy. I have seen the, you know, foundation of the International Renewable Energy Agency in UAE, for example. Uh, uh, and a lot of thrust coming on, on, on these alternative sources of energy in the wake of climate change it became even more relevant. So it has also the impact uh, on the overall dynamics. The, the, the various players, their interest in the region has also been linked with this. The, the other factor is, you know, the, uh, the, the perpetual tension between Israel and the other country, Iran particularly, and uh, then President Trump's uh, uh, presidency brought, uh, you know, various shifts in, in the uh, regional dynamics, which have even lingering even today, and killing of Qasim Soleimani, uh, the Iranian commander in, in, in uh, Iraq was a major factor which has again, uh, uh, I mean, changed a lot of dynamics, uh, equations in, in the region. Then, then thereafter came the, the warming of the relationship between the Arab countries and Israel, the so-called the Abraham Accords and all. We have seen uh, India being part of the I2U2 now. There are new synergies, new complementarities coming up. So I think many of these facets have been uh, covered in, in the uh, in this compilation, uh, I see very, very comprehensively here. Mm -hmm. uh, people here are also wary of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan and related impacts here uh, uh, for the region in terms of security. And then the COVID pandemic, which has brought all of us together in the joint fight, uh, fight against the, uh, the, the, the pandemic. From India's point of view, we, as and everyone knows, we are very much there it is an extended neighborhood we we have substantial trade substantial dependence on energy resources we have a sizable number of diaspora and we receive sizable amount of the remittances from the region with the current government india has transformed its relationship with the uh, region particularly with the major countries like uae and saudi arabia today they are our strategic partners we have a very close partner, political relationship with the other Gulf countries, and there have been overtures with the other countries also. There is a sincere interest also and a deep desire among the governments uh, in the remaining so-called the WANA countries, the other remaining uh, countries in the region. <clears throat> uh, there is also, we have observed that there is a, a desire to collaborate with India in the field of defense. And, and this is across the board. I mean, up to the all the North African countries, Egypt, and all these countries in the region. They are looking, we are known for our capacity building programs and all, but it has going beyond that with uh, um, interest in even looking for some, uh, you know, acquisition of platforms and uh, equipment. We have collaboration with these uh, many of these countries in, in the field of counterterrorism. We have intelligence cooperation. Uh, in anti-money laundering uh, measures uh, to, to control the uh, flow of narcotics, etc. And today we have excellent cooperation with these countries now in international forums, a good understanding on, on major regional and global issues. We also developed a very robust strategic partnership with Israel uh, over the years. This year we are celebrating 30 years of the relationship. Uh, Israeli Prime Minister was supposed to be in India, but uh, there were last minute health related issues. We developed a relationship based on agriculture and water, but today it has evolved in a, di a wide range of sectors, including defense, security, and many other important sectors. 
one of the prominent Indian company has been awarded the prestigious Hefa port of uh, Israel recently. In Egypt, we have signed two major MOUs with uh, uh, of $8 billion and $6 billion in the last month in, in the field of green hydrogen. So uh, the relationship is uh, evolving and it has actually expanded uh, in a very large uh, uh, canvas, uh, large spectrum of, of, of sectors. And uh, uh, I think we, we have deep interest in the stability and uh, uh, um, overall uh, collaboration in the field of security to maintain a, a peaceful uh, region in, in the longer horizons. So it is in nutshell as, as a representative of the, of the government, uh, I, I just broadly touch upon uh, these uh, broad contours of the regional dynamics. Uh, I, I, uh, I deeply appreciate the effort made by Ambassador Trigunaya and the entire team of Vivekanand Foundation and all the eminent writers in, in bringing together uh, the uh, very useful thoughts uh, in, 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 uh, at, at one place. Uh, and I wish uh, all the best and uh, look forward to have a good uh, discussion today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Raj Purohit, for this very comprehensive and holistic overview of the happening in the Middle Eastern region over the last, uh, I would say, uh, one or two decades. Very subtly and in a very nuanced manner, you have portrayed the unfolding geopolitical dynamics in the region. What's going to happen in the next decade or de more than that, a slightly decade and a half? You have uh, very brilliantly unfolded these things in front of all of us and indicated us, you know, the broad contours in which the things are moving. Okay? And I agree with you. I mean, definitely India has huge stakes and India also faces some very tough choices in this region. India has to balance its relationship with Israel and Iran also with Saudis and Iran. Okay. And likewise, the countries in the Middle East are also going to face some tough choices uh, as far as the relationship with China and India is concerned. China's expanding geopolitical and economic footprint is going to present them with tough questions because uh, definitely, you know, we have seen that uh, Israel has been shying away from taking some open positions vis-a-vis uh, -vis India and China. Likewise, it's, uh, it's an emerging, it's an unfolding scenario and uh, quite an interesting scenario for all these scholars for the counterterrorism scholars and for the diplomats also and lastly with the rise of the expansions so ambitions of countries like turkey and qatar india also faces some very tough security concerns also emanating from the middle east okay. so, and uh, before inviting uh, our uh, first panelist dr dorsey i would also take this opportunity to express my uh, so condolences, uh, heartfelt condolences to Ambassador Triguna for this loss uh, in his family. He is a very respected member of Usana's Foundation's advisory board, and he has been a mentor throughout uh, to all of us in this journey. Over the last two years, he has helped us. He has been a speaker and a participant in many of our discussions. Okay? So our heartfelt condolences. And uh, now I invite Dr. Dorsey. Uh, Dr. Dorsey, over to you, please. Uh, you know, I have read uh, a few things about uh, your thoughts uh, on the American withdrawal from the Middle East and its implications. Over to you, sir. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. Congratulations to all on the publication of this book. And let me also add my condolences to Ambassador Truganum's loss. Allow me to help set the stage by outlining what I think are the parameters of Middle East's of the Middle East security environment to which India will have to respond. Given time constraints, I'll do this in staccato headline style. I would have wished that we would have had been, or been able to a lot more time to discussion and to allow us to delve deeper into the issues. In any case, for starters, it goes without saying that the most immediate marker and determinant of the future of security in the Middle East will be the fate of the Iran nuclear agreement and what the response will be of regional actors, particularly Israel. I think one can safely assume that the covert Israeli-Iranian war is likely to continue irrespective of whether there is a revival of the nuclear accord. This war will not be fought only on Iranian and Israel Iranian territory and in cyberspace, but also in other parts of the Middle East, including Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Gaza, and potentially Yemen. Concerns about Iranian support for allied non-state actors like Hezbollah in Lebanon, 
pro-Iranian forces in Iraq, Islamic Jihad in Gaza, and Houthi rebels in Yemen, as well as Iran's ballistic missile program, cannot be negotiated in any substantive way without a holistic discussion of regional security that involves all parties, including Israel and Turkey, and potentially may have to be linked to security in the Eastern Mediterranean. Similarly, there is the question of the sustainability of the dialing down of tensions in recent years between Israel, Gulf states, Egypt, Turkey, and Iran. The fragility of some of these relationships is evident in the slow progress of efforts to renew ties between Saudi Arabia and Iran, Turkey and Egypt, and Turkey, the UAE, Israel, and Iran, as it plays out in countries like Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, Libya, and Iraqi Kurdistan. What is clear is that reduction of tensions is driven not only by economic factors, whether this involves economic transition in the Gulf, that is one of the main drivers of social change in the region, or economic crisis in countries like Turkey and Egypt, but also determined by geopolitics. Both China and Russia have made clear that their greater involvement in regional security is contingent on Middle Eastern players taking greater responsibility for managing regional conflict, reducing tensions, and their own defense. Longer term, there is a need to recognize that the window on the exclusive U.S. security umbrella in the Gulf is closing, and that transition to a multilateral security architecture that could still have the U.S. as its military backbone is inevitable. The trend eastwards in U.S. security and strategic priorities will drive this as much as an eventual Chinese unwillingness to be dependent on a hostile U.S. for its energy security. By the same token, greater European dependence on Gulf energy and the hedging policies of Gulf states are likely to drive moves towards multilateralism. The understandings and agreements between all countries, including those that do not have diplomatic relations, such as Israel, Iran, and Saudi Arabia, that would be needed to introduce a multilateral security arrangement are likely to be paradigm shifting and tectonic in nature. These understandings and agreements would have to involve management of maritime disputes, arms control, and some form of nuclear free zone. This be, may be the most consequential issue for India, irrespective of whether it wants to play an upfront role in a future multilateral arrangement. The biggest nut to crack in this is likely to be the deep hostility and distrust embedded in Iranian and Israeli attitudes towards one another, as well as Indian relations with Pakistan and China, particularly in anticipation of a nuclear arms race in the Middle East that is probable with or without a revival of the nuclear accord. The recent failure of the review of the Non-Proliferation tra Treaty, or NPT, complicates any effort to bring India and Pakistan into the NPT fold, a prerequisite for an effective and constructive Indian role in a holistic, multilateral approach to security in the Middle East. At the bottom line, getting from A to B will be the clincher. This will have to involve all parties as well as major external forces in an effort to take confidence building steps that address key issues at the core of the region's mutual distrust. The prospects of successfully building confidence on issues like the abandonment of the notion of regime change, recognition of the internationally recognized borders of all regional states, including Israel, Iranian nuclear intentions, arms control, Palestinian rights, and minority rights are difficult at best and definitely remote without a revival of the Iranian nuclear agreement. Which brings me full circle. The fate of the nuclear agreement, no matter how flawed or problematic one may find the accord, is what will shape regional security in the foreseeable future. It will determine the environment in which confidence can or cannot be built and understandings can be achieved on sensitive issues without which any attempted security architecture will either at worst be impossible to construct, and if constructed, likely to ultimately collapse, if not be stillborn from the outset. Obviously, this is at best a summary sketch, but hopefully it provides food for thought. Thank you for your attention and time.
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dorsey, for this excellent overview of the main problem spots uh, and uh, also uh, how we can achieve a stable security architecture and the role which this uh, Iranian nuclear deal plays in that. We'll get back to you with questions you know, to, uh, over the end of the session. Uh, but before that, uh, uh, I would like to invite Dr. N. Janardhan. Uh, my apologies, we are making a slight change in the whole sequence. Uh, uh, I'm inviting Dr. N. Janardhan first because he has to leave uh, for some urgent um, issue. So, Dr. N. Janardhan has contributed in this book and he's a senior fellow at Anwar Gargash Diplomatic Academy, UAE, and honorary fellow, Arab Gulf States Institute, Washington. Uh, Dr. Janardhan, over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Abhinav, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, apologies to those uh, who were scheduled to speak ahead of me. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, we have an engagement. In fact, uh, we have uh, the Indian Foreign Minister visiting the Academy in, um, in, in another half an hour. So I would, uh, you know, I, as I apologize, I, I uh, also want to just quickly lay out my thoughts uh, before heading out. Uh, you know, bitter sweet moment for Ambassador Trigunyat. Uh, condolences and congratulations to uh, you know, my chapter is basically an objective view of China's role in the region. Um, it, it may not be very popular in India, uh, but it is what it is. Uh, I've been living and working in the UAE for a fair bit, and uh, I, I see a lot of China in the Gulf and uh, West Asia. Often as Indians, uh, we see India, a lot of India in the <coughs> Gulf, but uh, there is plenty of China in, in, in the Gulf and West Asia too. Uh, you know, Someone once said that China always has a win-win policy in all its dealings in the world. Uh, it strikes win-win uh, deals, right? Uh, what it means actually by a win-win deal is, it that, is that it wins once and it wins a second time as well. That's why they call it a win-win deal. Uh, but on a more serious note, I think China's West Asia strategy needs to be viewed from the lens of uh, Gulf's Look East policy uh, since the turn of the century. While India has had uh, historic ties and uh, the US has been the main security guarantor for decades in the region, China has rapidly expanded its footprint in West Asia over the last two decades. I think uh, if I remember the figures right, from roughly about a billion dollars some 25 years ago in terms of its annual trade, uh, it currently is doing about uh, 65, 70 billion dollars. That's a big, big jump in just uh, 20 odd years. Uh, and it has, of course, become one of the region's uh, top trade partners and foreign investors. When I say 60, 70 billion dollars, I'm talking about just China's trade with uh, the UAE. Uh, of course, its announcement of the Belt and Road Initiative in 2013, uh, in particular, confirmed the strategic importance of West Asia and its global ambition. And then in 2016, it released the Arab Policy Paper, also highlighting the centrality of economic cooperation to China's engagement, engagement with West Asia. But I think it's important, uh, you know, for Indian policymakers to actually note a few trends that I'm about to highlight in terms of uh, China's engagement with the countries in the region. First, of course, just like India, China, I mean, China too has uh, great stakes here because it depends on the region for its energy needs. Actually, China has a much more diversified uh, supply chain than India has. Uh, but it still depends on the region for about 40% of its uh, oil and uh, this region actually uh, supplies uh, LNG too, uh, to China. Uh, the second thing, of course, is that West Asian countries, particularly those in the Gulf, have, have been major sources of infrastructure contracts uh, with, with Chinese firms. Uh, projects, as they call in, in quotes, projects that lend themselves to the BRI goal of connectivity such as ports and uh, industrial parks. And so they create an economic chain that links China to the Gulf, to the Arabian Sea, to the Red Sea and the Mediterranean. So in addition, Chinese investments in renewable energy, telecommunications space have also increased exponentially. Uh, so it's not just trade, but uh, technology, capital and connectivity too. Uh, when we talk of technology, let's not forget uh, 5G, right? I mean, there's a bit of a tiff going on here between uh, uh, China and the US and, and the GCC countries, the Gulf countries and the Middle East uh, have got caught up in, in, in that sort of conflict between the US, with the US insisting that uh, the, the Gulf countries not uh, 
you know, uh, use 5G, Chinese 5G technology in the Gulf countries saying we exercise our strategic autonomy to do what we want and what is beneficial to us. Uh, the third thing that I wanted to highlight is also that uh, China's relationships in the regional, um, you know, arena has, has been very strategic. Uh, like India, China too has comprehensive strategic partnership with Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Iran, Egypt and Algeria. Then there is uh, strategic cooperation with Turkey. Then there is strategic partnerships with Qatar, Kuwait and Oman. And uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE are considered pivot states, uh, which are crucial to China's global network politically and economy. And uh, Turkey is considered a node state, a bridge to facilitate Chinese interests. So China is operating in the region, not, uh, you know, in, in, in one fashion, but it has got a multi-layered approach to how it deals with different countries, giving different countries a different, uh, you know, importance. Uh, finally, I think it's also important to recognize the security dynamics. Uh, and China, as much as you may not like it, is gradually expanding its presence in the region. Uh, it, of course, opened its first overseas base in Djibouti. Uh, China has sent a total of some 31 fleets, 100 naval vessels, 26,000 officers and soldiers to the Gulf of Aden and waters off the coast uh, of Somalia to carry out escort missions. All of this between 2008 and 2018. During the same period, I think uh, uh, it, it escorted roughly about 6,600 ships, 51% uh, of which was uh, foreign vessels. And this again is in the Gulf of Aden and waters of Somalia. So this means that amid a palpable uh, US disengagement as, uh, you know, from the region, uh, China, among others, will have an important role to play in the region's future security architecture. Uh, now, importantly, like India, China has managed to build friendly relationships with all the states in West Asia. This was alluded to a while ago, um, and, and it has maintained, uh, you know, a distance from regional conflicts and rivalries. And contrary to the United States, it has promoted the idea of neutral engagement and mutual benefits with its regional partners. Uh, and so this has enabled uh, China to maintain good relations with countries that are hostile to one another, such as Israel and Iran with which, of course, it has signed a 25-year strategic cooperation agreement in 21. Uh, so there is no empirical evidence, of course, to suggest that China desires to replace the United States as a dominant external military power in the region. But there's also no doubt that it will progressively become a major force shaping the stability and security of West Asia in the future. Uh, and this, of course, is the cause for concern among many countries, including India. And this concern will perhaps increase because of the potential security imprint of the Belt and Road Initiative projects, because China will seek to invest more in protecting its investments, people and projects uh, by virtue of increasing its security presence, which will add to the anxiety of the United States and others, including India. Now, experts argue that Chinese naval strength is already advancing steadily while that of the U.S. is declining. I'm sure uh, we have enough, uh, you know, uh, pointers to suggest that India is also rapidly expanding its uh, naval prowess. But I think along with enhancing its uh, naval capabilities, China has worked hard to expand its naval infrastructure facilities in the Belt and Road Initiative countries. Um, a report a few years ago suggested that Chinese companies were involved in the building and maintenance of about 40 ports in about 35 countries, including West Asia and the Gulf. So, again, along with increasing its economic and security influence in West Asia, Beijing has expanded its behind-the-scene role in regional diplomacy. I think this is very important to note, which is not out in the public domain too much, but one such case is Beijing's role in helping negotiate the 2015 Iranian nuclear deal. Um, there are some reports which indicate that actually President Barack Obama thanked uh, President Xi for uh, facilitating, uh, for enabling uh, the, the JCPOA. Uh, second, I think to safeguard and promote China's economic interests, Chinese scholars are advocating diplomatic tactics uh, that could help strengthen Beijing's developing global security role. And uh, these tactics include mediation, not so much to make the place stable from the perspective of the region itself, but more so to defend commercial uh, 
and and not so much about security interests. So it's called conflict management. It's not conflict resolution. I think the West invests time, energy, and effort in terms of trying to resolve conflicts, but China is saying let's manage conflicts better, uh, promoting a harmonious relationship among China's strategic partners, many of whom are deeply divided and involved in proxy wars. So, if one were to somehow uh, speculate, I, I perhaps could say that China has got a hand in trying to encourage some of these countries that are now reconciling, be it uh, Turkey with Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia with Iran, UAE with Turkey, UAE with, uh, with uh, Iran as well. So I think these tactics for China serve two objectives. First, they dilute criticism about Beijing being uninterested in punching below its weight to stabilize the region. Second, they promote the Chinese notion of a balanced diplomatic approach that relies more on mediation. Uh, it, it is uh, actually pursuing what they call posse mediation diplomacy. Um, so in such a milieu, I think India must recalibrate its strategy. And the title of my book is, I mean, my chapter is India's counter to China's West Asia strategy. Is it going to be cooperation? competition or confrontation. Uh, I think it's a question of whether one is an optimist, pessimist or a fatalist, right? I think all those options are possible, but India must, I think, really recalibrate its strategy. It could achieve what Barack Obama once said about Saudi Arabia and Iran, cold peace with China. It could, it did not necessarily view China as an enemy. Uh, it could be frenemies. Uh, there's also a new concept uh, called rivalry partners. Why not? Uh, Graham Allison uh, has proposed the idea of rivalry partners. You could be rivals, but you could be partners as well. So the two countries, India and China, with oversized egos, I think must cooperate, compete, and avoid confrontation. It could be cooperative competition. It could be competitive cooperation, but surely not confrontation. How can... If the two countries evolve such a game plan, I think I've suggested uh, a few uh, pointers, a few recommendations in my book. I, uh, you know, urge you to read the chapter. Uh, and if you have, uh, you know, any comments, any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer if we can have a discussion offline via mm -hmm. email. Uh, the organizers can share my email with you. Thank, Thank you very much. And I wish you all good luck uh, as you proceed with the uh, conversation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Janardhan. And you know, this subject is of a particular interest to us because we recently organized uh, three roundtable discussions on China's increasing geopolitical footprint in the Middle East. You know, and definitely we discussed uh, the various uh, dimensions of this particular issue. And I agree with you that India will have to find uh, some kind of a modus vivendi uh, to engage or how to look at China. India continues to have deep misgivings, you know, about China as far as the security and the intelligence issues are concerned. Uh, and I see that the, there are a couple of reasons behind that because uh, China has majorly used Pakistan's, you know, human footprint in India as far as the, uh, its interoperations are concerned. And also its technological prowess, you know, continues to make us quite uncomfortable. So India also needs to enhance its uh, technological capabilities, intelligence capabilities, and also the diplomatic understanding in order to, you know, make, uh, arrive at a modus vivendi to deal with China in the Middle East. Thank you so much, Dr. Janathan, for joining us. And we would like to invite you for our future discussions also. Right now, I know that you are in a hurry. So good luck with your uh, with the visit of Dr. Jay Shankar. Thank you. And thanks for joining. Congratulations on writing this chapter. And uh, so before I invite uh, uh, General Raj Shukla, who is a special guest today, uh, for his brief comments uh, on the subject on, and on the book, uh, I would like to congratulate uh, my dear friend and also the head of Pentagon Publishing, uh, Mr. Rajan Arya. Uh, the Pentagon Publishing is doing a commendable job. Pentagon has published this book and uh, they have published several books on 
difference in geopolitical issues, including my book, Radicalization in India, was also published by the Pentagon Publishers. So once again, congratulations, uh, Mr. Rajan, for this excellent book. And uh, now I invite uh, General Raj Shukla. He's a special guest with us today. He's the member of the Union Public Service Commission. It's a very special body. This body recruits India's diplomats, India's senior police officials, India's civil servants. You know. So we are lucky to have him here today. And uh, over to you, General Shukla, for your brief comments on the subject. Thank you, Thank you very much. I'm, I'm no expert on the region, but, but just a distant observer. So I'll just make uh, two, three comments and uh, I would elicit responses from the specialists, uh, the, um, the chapter contributors. You know, one is uh, in the context of waning US influence and uh, the, the rising Chinese footprint. So in one of the recent issues of foreign affairs, I gleaned this uh, observation from a piece written by Amale Jamal and Michael Robbins, which kind of resonated with me. And uh, based on a public opinion research, so a, a robust public opinion research, they conclude that democracy's failure to produce the kind of economic change that people across West Asia crave for has led to, you know, China stepping in in a big way. And if you uh, read... Uh, I mean, um, other literature in international affairs, what China is now doing is that it is uh, pitching its brand of its, its political system versus the brand that of American democracy. And it is asserting that their brand delivers, I mean, in terms of poverty elevation, delivery on infrastructure, energy, so on and so forth. So, uh, I mean, uh, how would you view this? I mean, the Chinese are arguing that their brand delivers and a public opinion uh, survey in West Asia almost uh, detoing uh, that, uh, that, that reality. And the second observation I have is, you know, uh, about this growing, uh, uh, what shall I say, uh, trans-regional military influence. And I'll just give you some examples. Leave alone China, a middling power like Turkey uh, has got a major military base in Somalia today. So countries in this region are expanding their footprints uh, into Africa and other places. Uh, the UAE is looking for naval bases across the Horn of Africa. And in the recent, uh, I mean, in the ongoing civil war between the Ethiopians and rebels, from the uh, Tigray region, we had four Middle East countries involved. So Turkey, Iran, UAE, and Qatar. So we see a different kind of Middle East, which is getting ambitious, which is making very definite political choices, quite removed from uh, uh, the, the, the trends of the past. So these are two you know, issues about this the West Asian region, which caught my attention, and I would be very happy if the chapter contributors or some of the specialists uh, would care to comment on that. Thank you very much, uh, General Shukla, for your insightful and interesting comments. <clears throat> and, uh, I'm sure our eminent panelists would address all these questions. Thank you once again for joining us today. So now I'd like to invite our next panelist, uh, Dr. Michael Barak who has also joined uh, Usana's foundation recently as a senior fellow. So I congratulate him and we're really glad and we're honored to have him on board in Usana's foundation and also for this discussion. And my apologies, uh, Dr. Barak, for this you know, change in the sequence because some, uh, some of the panelists have to leave early. So that's why I made the change. Okay, and over to you. Though. Okay, so first of all, thanks a lot for uh, inviting me to this session. And I would like to express my uh, condolences to uh, Ambassador Anil uh, Trigunayat. And also I want to, to thank him for giving me the opportunity to write a chapter uh, to this book. I would like also to thank you, Dr. Abhinav Pandya, on organizing this webinar and also for uh, uh, joining to your uh, foundation. So first of all, uh, I would like to say that my chapter, in my, my chapter, I was uh, focusing on the increasing and create uh, 
multiple uh, conflict zones which can be exploited by terrorist uh, actors like the Houthis, which are the proxy of uh, Iran in Yemen, and El Shabab El Mujahideen, the official Al Qaeda offshoot in Somalia. Now, the Red Sea, as you know, is an extension of uh, of the Indian Ocean, straight, stretching along the northeastern uh, side of Africa, and is connected to the Mediterranean Sea by the Suez Canal. Uh, the population population uh, along it is estimated at uh, six uh, million and uh, uh, six hundred millions and uh, is expected to grow by about uh, one and above one billion people uh, in early 2050. The importance of the Red Sea lies in its uh, strategic uh, location. It's a major axis for the international trade. Some, let's say that about some 30 percent of the world contain container traffic passes uh, each year in this region. In addition to its commercial importance, these are uh, there are also large oil and gas reserves in the Red Sea uh, Basin. The average is about 5 billion barrels of undiscovered oil and uh, 100, 100, 112 trillion uh, cubic feet uh, recoverable gas. Uh, so therefore, we can have a clue about what motivates state actors to achieve a stronghold in the Red Sea. Competition on uh, energies and uh, uh, other interests. So the chapter that I wrote uh, was written uh, before the eruption of the Russian-Ukrainian uh, war. Since then, uh, of course, the tension between Russia and the West has only become deeper and increased the co competition in all the fields, including energy resources and the maritime uh, zones. zones. Regarding Russia, Russia ambitions in the Red Sea, only uh, one month ago, in the, let's say on July 31st of uh, this year, Russian President Vladimir Putin uh, signed a decree that approved the country's uh, new maritime uh, doctrine. Part of uh, Putin's uh, vision is to expand uh, Russia's global influence by having foot, a foothold in the Indian Sea and the Red Sea. For this purpose, pur purpose, Russia aims to establish uh, its first Red uh, Sea naval port in uh, Sudan. But there are, but uh, let's say that there are several obstacles that prevent uh, Russia to fulfill these uh, intentions. Uh, the military military leadership in Sudan is in a debate on uh, this issue because of American pressure and also uh, Egyptian pressures on Sudan not to give Russia a naval uh, base. It seems that Sudan uh, wants to draw financial investments from the West and therefore uh, can, is, is not giving 100% uh, to Russia if it's ready to uh, open a Russian uh, naval port in uh, Sudan. Uh, but uh, let's say that after Russia-Ukraine war, we see that there is a kind of a positive shift in the stance of uh, the Sudanese regime to uh, Russia, uh, but it's still early to know what Sudan uh, will decide. Uh, I, in my opinion, Sudan is playing in all uh, in all uh, the fields in order to see what it can gain uh, more. Uh, regarding China, which was mentioned there and was uh, written in the in the book, China aspires, of course, to become a global land and sea power, as evidenced by a long-term strategic plan published by President Xi Jinping in 2013 under the name Belt and Road Initiative. China wants to establish Chinese bases inland and sea by forming uh, alliances with various countries that will allow to it to build and develop uh, infrastructure, develop existing ports, and uh, establish new ports from China uh, to East Africa and the Red Sea. China opened also its first overseas uh, naval base in Djibouti at uh, the entrance to the Red Sea. Uh, and the country, Djibouti is also the home to, is uh, also home to the only permanent U.S. base uh, in Africa. Uh, U.S. analysts, as we see that there is a, a growing American concern from Chinese uh, expansion and its in growing influence uh, on the African continent. According to U.S. analysts, uh, China is uh, threatening American interest and assets in this region. Therefore, uh, U.S. analysts advise to the U.S. government to have a naval uh, presence in the Red Sea if any conflict uh, with China develops, especially now after uh, the Russian-Ukraine war, which there is a growing concern if China is going to make an action through uh, Taiwan. 
regarding Iran, which is also the problem of Israel and uh, some uh, uh, Gulf states. So Iran is aspires to achieve hegemony in the Middle East arena, and uh, therefore Iran aims to develop its maritime navy and expand its influence in the maritime zones outside the Arabic Gulf, such as the Aden Gulf and uh, the Red Sea. Iranian support for the Houthis can be seen as an uh, articulation of Iran's efforts to expand its influence in the Red Sea. Israel and the Gulf states, some of the Gulf states, are not interested in uh, an Iranian consolidation in the Red Sea. In 2018, former Israeli chief of staff Gadi Eisenkot said that Tehran, Tehran plans to take over the Middle East in two axes. One axis passes through Iraq to Syria and from there to Lebanon. And the second axis passes through the Gulf from Bahrain to Yemen to the Red Sea. Israel is determined to prevent Iranian consolidation in this region by any means. Therefore, we see that there is a growing Israeli-American naval maneuvers in the Red Sea. Uh, and uh, also there is a growing uh, security ties with Egypt, UAE, Saudi and other countries in the region uh, in order to cope with the Iranian, Iranian threat in, uh, the, uh, in the region and other places. Uh, regarding non-state actors, of course there are also other uh, state actors, but because of limitations of time I cannot uh, refer to them. If you want you can read the chapter. But it's important to refer to the non-state actors that pose a threat to the Red Sea region. And I will refer only to the Houthis, which are, which are the most dangerous threat to the security of the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea. It's uh, because it's an Iranian property that is very well equip equipped with uh, weapon technology, fans and instructions from uh, IRGC. If, uh, the Houthis have already exploited the maritime arena to launch terror attacks against Saudi Arabia by deploying naval uh, mines using remote controlled uh, bomb uh, laden boats, gliders and firing uh, missiles. In the period between January 2017 and June 2021, the Houthis carried out 24 attacks against Saudi targets uh, at sea using uh, aerial drones. Egypt, of course, is also concerned about the situation and is afraid that uh, an escalation in Yemen will cause the Babel Mandeb Strait to shut down and therefore prevent oil tankers coming from the Gulf through the Red Sea uh, to get inside the Suez Canal and from there to the Mediterranean uh, Sea. Of course, there are other uh, state actors that are trying to have a foothold in the Red Sea, like Turkey and also Pakistan. Uh, I've not mentioned all of them. Uh, there is also, for example, in the chapter, I refer to the growing uh, tension between Egypt to Ethiopia because of the Renaissance Dam. Uh, and uh, Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates are trying and in investing efforts in order to mediate and to find a solution on Ethiopia and uh, Egypt. Uh, and to sum up, uh, in order to cope with these growing challenges, with this competition and uh, the threat of instability of the Red Sea, uh, we need a network of moderate uh, state actors to defend the, the security and the stability of the region, uh, strengthening the, the security cooperation between Israel and the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, the US and India in the Red Sea can definitely help uh, to defend on the stability of uh, the Red Sea. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Barak, for beautifully explaining this matrix of the state and non-state actors and the emerging geopolitical dynamics and security concerns in the Red Sea region. Thank you very much. We'll get back to you with more questions. But before that, I would like to invite our next panelist, General Rakesh Sharma, who is a distinguished fellow at VIF and CLAWS and also the member of the Executive Council IDSA. Uh, General Sharma, I will here. Over to you. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Abhinav, for inviting me. And uh, my heartfelt condolences to Ambassador Anil Tugnayat also for his bereavement in the family. Uh, now, it was a privilege for me to write a chapter in this book, and mine was largely related to de defense cooperation with India and the secure security dynamic uh, investigation in particular. And uh, I have approached the subject with a little histor historical background and overview as to the kind of relationship we've had with West Asia for a very long time, 
uh, from the area, from the times of Indus Valley civilization and links with Dilmun civilization in modern Bahrain. Of course, uh, there was the third century BC when the Mauryan emperors, Chandragupt Maurya had exchanged, Ashoka had exchanged them. Uh, ambassadors across there. We have also have been extensive fighting experience in the First World War in, in West Asia. We played, uh, Indians played a key role in the British campaigns in Europe and West Asia during the First World War. Uh, cavalry, especially Space Canal, Haifa, these are names, Mesopotamia, Gallipoli, these are names that we have uh, our uh, second uh, thought process to us and we have followed the campaigns across there. So we have a, a long and historic relationship with West Asia. Our current relationship with West Asia uh, are broadly economic, commercial ties, security ties, um, and, you know, they have a vast array of trade investment, energy security, migrant workers, they ask for uh, counter-terrorism, maritime security. Many have been brought out, uh, brought out early by Ambassador Raj Prohit also. And uh, so the uh, three very large uh, a security interest that we have with West Asia, of course, was related to energy security. We secure, uh, we obtain uh, eighty percent of our oil leads from West Asia, uh, about fifty-five percent of oil and eighty-five percent of natural gas. And um, the second very important issue is the diaspora. We, you know, we are well aware that uh, the diaspora plays a very important role in India's policy towards West Asia. Nine odd million that is stated as. Uh, India's uh, diaspora gives us a credible soft power advantage uh, in relationship with all West Asian states. And uh, of course, then the adds on to it the remittances, remittances that we get every year uh, from, the, uh, from the diaspora uh, uh, people settled there. In, uh, you know, we, of course, have also been responsible for lifting in, as a security issue uh, when uh, things go bad, like, for example, in the times of Iraq war in the early 90s. Uh, we had a massive operation and took about two odd months to airlift about uh, um, to, to uh, uh, lift up our Indians from um, the Middle East and Kuwait. Subsequently, one lakh seventy thousand, one hundred seventy thousand uh, Indians were lifted by, from Kuwait, and uh, similarly we did it from Lebanon in two thousand six, uh, and of course also lifted up people of the South Asian origin, which is Sri Lankans and and um, Nepalese. So that for that matter. Uh, our involvement in 2020, as we have in, in the in the pandemic times again, there was a major air and sea evacuation effort taken on West Asia, which is about 300,000 migrant Indians. So that you know, all this will remain as a perpetual security challenge for us uh, uh, in in a manner of uh, um, uh, our involvement across with the uh, the diaspora of in, in of Indian origin people settled across in West Asia. And third major issue is that the look west policy, the look west policy given out by Prime Minister Modi specifically uh, in, uh, in on uh, 26 September 2014, uh, it's been a discussion for quite some time. The look west policy also entailed a push across to the Indian Armed Forces and the defense establishment to work uh, to that end. And, and therefore, I would say that uh, this is a multi-layered relationship. In the course of our development of relationship, there are a very large number of st uh, strategic dialogues and interactions that have developed between various countries. Uh, uh, in the Middle East, we have one with UAE from 2003, Qatar with 2008, Saudi Arabia 14, uh, Amman 2016, Jordan 2018. So we have a series of strategic dialogues and strategic relationships that have developed uh, uh, in, uh, on various issues uh, between the nations across here. And of course, uh, we have also been doing a large number of exercises um, uh, to, to build up defense cooperation between the countries, which are uh, encompassed uh, military to military interaction, joint military training, National Security Council level discussion, signing of MOUs on counter piracy, counter terrorism, counter extremism, intelligence sharing, maritime security, uh, prisoner repatriation. So, the ambit of our discussion and our relationship with various nations of, of uh, uh, West Asia actually involves the entire gamut of security affairs and it's a constant relationship that we maintain across there. There are army to army, army, navy, air force, ministry of defense talks that take place for, at defense secretary level and, and with Oman at army level, uh, navy level, air force. So there is a, 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 a continuous relationship that has been developed over a long period of time. 
this uh, transition of our relationship with Saudi Arabia is most significant. You know, um, the Prime Minister's visits and, you know, the defense cooperation signed with uh, King uh, Salman bin Abdulaziz al Saud in February 2014, expertise, expertise on training, defense cooperation. So, all these have developed over a long period of time. Uh, we have conducted exercises and continuously conduct exercises of the Air Force in Al Dafra in Abu Dhabi about a uh, couple of years ago. Then, there, of course, India and UAE, which have uh, major exercise across here. Movement across now on Make in India, which is uh, happening subsequently uh, with the uh, Ordnance Factory Board having signed deals with UAE to supply uh, artillery. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a process that is moving forward of export of Indian um, wherewithal, military wherewithal across two countries across in this one. Now, the issue that rankles across there is, of course, the issue of transnational linkages of of terrorism. Uh, there are, these are very major focal points, three major issues. One is terror financing, which we believe uh, has got that Hawala links across with West Asia, which, which, which hurts us. And those are issues which uh, are of interest to us. Second is our persons of interest, many of them who uh, are, uh, you know, people who are inimical with India, who are in here or are there uh, West Asia or they have links across West Asia and also thirdly the travel routes you know the routes that many of these uh, people of interest who take in who have inimical designs against India take travel routes to West Asia and so we, obviously there is a significant amount of money being channeled through Gulf to India through informal Hawala networks and unregulated trust based systems uh, these are very major issues that that uh, are concerned to us and there is dialogue on, there is discussion on, there is um, assistance on, on these scores. And of course, much has to be done still on the issue of terrorism linkages that have, uh, that obviously have links across towards uh, West Asia. And we will uh, continue this. And before ending it, I will just end, uh, add one issue here. And that's the issue which has come up number, in, uh, number of times in this debate today is uh, the issue of the Chinese linkages with countries here in West Asia. Now, that's a given. You just cannot challenge it. China has uh, got 100 odd ports in 63 countries all over the world. It has got extensive relationships in um, in, uh, in Maghreb, in, in Wana areas, in, in, uh, in nearly what uh, nearly all, countries, all 54 nations of Africa. So the Chinese have deep pockets and they have deep relationships. And they have deep relationships in West Asia also. Now, uh, uh, whether uh, what and it, China should be a like country, a loved country, whether China is liked or loved is not important. China has an influence, it has pockets and it is deep pockets by uh, varied means, including by investments across into many of these countries and tying them, ties uh, that the, these countries have developed uh, with China. That is there to stay. This is not in the near future. This, whatever we might say, Chinese economy is now going down. It's not at the apex as, as it used to be earlier, but it does not imply. So even in the worst of times, in, um, Chinese trade was $600 billion in the month of June, of which $100 billion was a plus trade that they had. Uh, I mean, they gained $100 billion. You can't challenge the, uh, the second largest economy in the world to not make ingress across and buy influence if it cannot be uh, created on its own. So, India, its relationships with, say, West Asia or any one of these countries that we want to develop relationships have to work through it. We have to go to our cultural movement, to our relationships of our diaspora, which is is working so well across in these countries and also uh, our own trade ties. So we have to get our own thing separately, despite the fact that the Chinese have um, developed this has to be put into separate baskets. Uh, uh, you, it's not easy to remove China from West Asia or any other part of the world in, easy, in, uh, in time to come. That is my opinion, and that's according to what I've penned down in my chapter, and I look forward to the book coming out. And thank you for inviting me, Anipa, uh, I'm missing uh, Ambassador Anil Trugna today.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, General Sharma, for you know, presenting this very wide uh, ambit of India's engagement with the Middle East, particularly the defense ties. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. And um, I can see that uh, Mr. Ravi Solanki has also joined us today. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate him because uh, he has joined Usana's foundation as a distinguished fellow, and um, he brings a long, uh, more than a decades long experience of working in Middle East with the United Nations. He was posted in Iraq. And we are really honored to have him on board. And now I invite our next panelist, Nina Slama, who has also contributed a chapter in this book. And she also works at Asana's Foundation as the India Israeli Affairs Coordinator. Nina, over to you. Thank you, Abina. So, in my book chapter, I uh, analyzed uh, the next steps for India Israel relations. We know that since Prime Minister Narendra Modi came to power, he wanted to extend the relations between both countries. But he wanted to do it gradually in order not to alienate uh, different Western Asian countries uh, in the region. So, first of all, uh, he visited uh, uh, these countries. Uh, these countries, we're talking about Qatar, about uh, the Gulf countries, uh, and um, and it was only three three years later in uh, 2017 that uh, he was the first sitting prime minister to visit Israel. Now there were some dynamics in the Western Asia in West Asia that led to the rapprochement between both countries. We're talking about the Arab Spring, who puts aside the Palestinian issues from the regional and international agendas. And we're talking also about the GCPOA, uh, uh, the signing of the of this deal in 2015, uh, that um, raised many concerns uh, in uh, the minds of different uh, uh, Gulf countries and, of course, Israel. Uh, since Iran is calling for the annihilation of Israel, and this is why today Israel is very against the uh, revival of the Iranian deal. And um, and also the signing of the Abraham Accords in 2020 made it possible for Israel to uh, extend and normalize its relations with Bahrain, the UAE, Morocco and Sudan. India wanted to be uh, involved in these different dynamics and uh, to play a more regional, um, regional role in the region. And uh, this is why it became part of the I2U2 alliance, which is comprised by Israel, India, the US and the UAE. Many people saw this new alliance as an answer to China and Iran uh, influence and aspirations in West Asia. But actually, most uh, uh, of the leaders of these countries uh, present this alliance as being a, an economic cooperation, especially after the COVID-19 pandemic erupted in the world, and many uh, countries suffered from the implications of this pandemic. And um, today, um, is, uh, India is promoting a de-hyphenate policy, which means that it's dealing separately with the different uh, countries in West Asia. We're talking about having good relations with Israel and the Palestinian Authority, with Iran and Saudi Arabia. But the question is whether India will be able to continue and maintain this policy and promote this policy. Because many countries have conflictual interests in the region. And we also already saw, uh, see different uh, countries in the world criticizing India for not taking sides in the Russian Ukrainian war. So, will it be uh, possible to, for India to continue and uh, promote this policy? Time will say. But will India and the other partners of the I2U2 alliance will be able to maintain this alliance and promote a fruitful um, engagement um, following uh, the, the uh, dynamics, different dynamics and different challenges that are occurring today, not just in West Asia, but also in the world. So these are questions that um, we, will, we will see uh, in the uh, near future. Now, India and Israel have normalized their relations in 1992. 
And since then, they became strategic partners and are, a, and are a collaborating on a wide range of sectors. We're talking about defense, economy, a cybersecurity, and so forth. And I think that the willingness of both India and Israel to engage in more multilateral engagements will lead both countries to extend the relation not only on the bilateral level, but also on the multilateral level. And we will see more and more engagement, engagements with other partners in West Asia, which will involve both countries. But it is important that both countries will continue to engage on the bilateral level, because we all know that multilateralism uh, always uh, or most of the time led countries to compromise on essential issues in order to promote a fruitful and and continuous dialogue between them. So I think that uh, the, the different dynamics uh, that, uh, in West Asia will continue to occur in different uh, aspects and different areas, especially now with the uh, willingness uh, to revive the uh, nuclear deal and with Iran. But uh, it is important that uh, the, the countries will continue to engage uh, in these kinds of alliances uh, in order to uh, bring to a more prosperous and stable, uh, um, a stable, uh, um, stable region and stable uh, atmosphere in West Asia, which is not a stable region at all. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Lena. Thank you very much for outlining the various nuances of the Indo-Israel ties and uh, definitely the emerging geopolitical situation in the Middle East. Uh, you raised an issue of uh, India being, uh, uh, I would say, an observer or not taking sides uh, in various geopolitical contexts. Uh, in fact, I would like to thank you for bringing this uh, issue uh, in the discussion. Uh, it has generated a lot of interest uh, and this is of a very particular interest to me also because I feel that, uh, you know, a lot of uh, misconceptions are prevailing, uh, especially as far as the India's uh, stand is concerned. Uh, India has always taken a position and that is always, it's based on the very principled uh, uh, and ideological reasons and principled reasons, pragmatic reasons of diplomacy. So we have taken the position and it's not just India that has uh, faced such uh, tough uh, diplomatic choices. Various other countries have also faced such choices. For instance, like, you know, Israel. Israel also faces this, uh, you know, pro this choice of taking sides when it has to deal with India and China. For instance, the U.S. U.S. also faces this choice. In fact, in the early uh, 2000s, the U.S. was having two different kinds of relationship with the Pakistan. They were hailing Musharraf as one of the great saviors and one of the great supporters in their global war against terrorism. And at the same time, U.S. was uh, promising great support to India in its fight against terrorism and you know, hailing India as one of the greatest democracies. So this kind of a dicey ch situation, these choices, uh, like all the countries face, even in its relationship with Turkey, U.S. has faced uh, such tough choices, you know. Uh, so I guess we all face such choices, but these are always a very uh, important part of the global discussions on diplomacy and various other things. So before I invite our next panelist, um, I would like to welcome and felicitate uh, Dr. Arvind Gupta, who is the director of VIF, and he has joined our discussion today. And... Uh, uh, he has also been a mentor in this uh, great book. Personally, also, he has been a mentor to me in my previous writings for Vivekananda International Foundation. And um, he has wonderful insights on the issues of national security and foreign policy. He served as the Deputy National Security Advisor of India and is currently heading the Vivekananda International Foundation. Uh, sir, I welcome you. And uh, sir, would you like to share some thoughts? Yeah. No, firstly... Uh... Uh, thank you for organizing uh, this uh, discussion. And uh, Ambassador uh, Anil Tribunayat, uh, uh, who has uh, taken this initiative, and uh, I must uh, congratulate him uh, for uh, you know putting together a uh, uh, eminent uh, uh, authors and experts uh, together. And uh, has he has brought out uh, a very uh, interesting book. And I don't say it simply because uh, I have to say it at a book discussion. But uh, these are very deep articles. 
and uh, there is a, a deep expertise in each of uh, these articles and we just heard at least i heard uh, two of these general rakesh sharma's and uh, uh, nina's uh, salma's uh, 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 presentations uh, it is uh, no secret that uh, in india's uh, uh, foreign policy uh, in the last few years if you see uh, certainly uh, there is a, a significant uh, shift in india's relations with west asia and uh, the credit uh, goes uh, to uh, prime minister modi and uh, his uh, team the external affairs minister and the em uh, and of course uh, this has been uh, 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 long in coming uh, the work for this had started uh, even earlier and uh, we recently uh, had uh, a senior official of the MEA uh, who had uh, uh, handled this desk uh, for a number of years, uh, uh, even before, a few years before uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi's uh, first term. And uh, uh, it was quite clear that uh, uh, India will have to break into this charmed circle. And uh, the fact that uh, our relationship with Israel started way back in the 90s was also a part of the same thinking. Uh, the region is so complex, so complicated, uh, and uh, so sensitive that for any country, uh, it is not very easy uh, to uh, break into uh, that uh, uh, region. And we had a important relationship, but a somewhat limited relationship, limited to diaspora and uh, energy. and. Uh, also, we were uh, hampered by the fact that uh, many of uh, the countries in the region, uh, they saw the relationship with India uh, through the prism of uh, Pakistan or through uh, OIC, etc. Uh, but that mindset has now uh, changed. And, you know, this uh, I2U2, uh, the new organization, uh, which uh, has now come into being, which is also in a sense uh, some Western quad, I think that signifies a shift in India thinking, Indian thinking and also in the thinking in the con uh, uh, countries of the region. And uh, the relationship uh, is becoming uh, uh, multi-pronged and uh, there is uh, a strong uh, economic element, people-to-people -people element, diplomatic element. And as General Rakesh Sharma uh, uh, enumerated, also the defense uh, component and uh, terrorism and counterterrorism, and I think cybersecurity has also been added. But in the last few years, uh, we have also seen that uh, uh, the dialogue now includes even uh, other areas like uh, food uh, security, uh, which is uh, very critical for uh, the countries in the West Asian uh, region. Uh, and also, this has coincided with the uh, a decline in the influence of uh, Pakistan for various reasons. We need not go into that. And uh, that has also, uh, I think, uh, compelled many of the countries in the region to look at India uh, from a different uh, uh, perspective, and particularly in the context of uh, India's rising economy and uh, its uh, technological prowess, and also the fact that our relationship with the US has also uh, enhanced. So these are, I think, propitious times, uh, and uh, we uh, are very uh, happy that uh, uh, the Indian foreign policy and the relationship with almost all countries, including on both sides of the Gulf, uh, Iran also, uh, is uh, reasonably well. And I think India has played uh, uh, its uh, diplomatic uh, cards uh, very well. Having said that, I think uh, we should... Uh, uh, still, at least I feel that uh, we are still in early stages of uh, the evolution of uh, India's relationship uh, uh, with these countries. Uh, we have in some areas a deep relationship, but uh, in the particularly in the area of uh, economic uh, uh, cooperation and uh, uh, in the new areas like technology, food, uh, and also uh, energy uh, security, which is not just uh, buying and buying uh, the uh, oil and gas from there, but uh, in a larger uh, uh, context, I think we need to ha we still have a lot of work to uh, do in this area. And you mentioned about uh, China, 
uh, which is uh, a, a factor. And I think uh, that is probably the uh, next uh, frontier that uh, we need to uh, 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 conquer. Because uh, China, uh, given our relationship, uh, state of relationship with, with China, one can expect that uh, there would be some headwinds in our, uh, making, uh, 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 you know, increasing our uh, uh, presence uh, in the region, and we'll be competing on many areas, not necessarily uh, as uh, as uh, uh, rivals, but simply because uh, China's economic relationship uh, and other relationships are very deep, as you uh, just said. So, how do we do that? I think this book and uh, the people who are here. Uh, they, they could uh, give us some ideas as to how do we take this relationship to a new uh, level. Uh, so in my view, I think there are two or three things that uh, uh, we need to do. One is that uh, uh, the economic uh, relationship has to be strengthened further and it has to go and we have to have more investments in uh, each other's countries. Uh, so uh, there are still a lot of uh, uh, issues and problems uh, the Western countries are, uh, I think, uh, a little shy uh, of uh, investing in India. There are our own uh, rules and regulations, etc. Uh, they don't want a prominent sheikh to be dragged into some, you know, uh, a court uh, in India for some economic uh, uh, dispute or something. So, how do we assure them that uh, a greater investment comes in? And so ease of doing business uh, with the, the investigations, I think that requires a little different uh, approach. So that is one uh, area. The second, I think, is uh, the on the security side. Now, it's okay to have these uh, joint exercises, etc. that certainly builds trust, that uh, uh, improves the familiarity, etc. But uh, most of these uh, interactions are very preliminary interactions. And they uh, help you uh, know the other side better and build trust, as I said. But does it really help in building a security architecture for the region? And for us, I think one of our weaknesses of our relationship has been that uh, the security architecture in the region, which is uh, dominated uh, by uh, uh, the US uh, and also by certain issues which are very complicated, uh, India should be a part of it. Uh, how do we do that? I think we need to do some uh, thinking. And of course, our relationship uh, with Israel is important, but that relationship is also more in the nature of uh, uh, defense cooperation and defense technologies and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, is there a, a in the new uh, world that we are seeing, will there be a new security architecture uh, in uh, the region and will India be a part of it? And you know, for that, uh, India has to uh, uh, look at uh, the key issues uh, in the uh, region. There is this uh, Palestinian issue, there is Syria, there are civil wars in several uh, countries which are going on, there is Iran-Saudi relationship, and uh, so many of these. Uh, I think there is uh, there are some uh, countries with whom we can uh, deal with more easily than uh, with others, and I think we should do that. And uh, Oman was uh, mentioned, uh, and uh, that's one country which we should look at uh, uh, closely. And uh, Oman, uh, uh, we have a, a defense cooperation agreement, and also, uh, uh, you know, our defense minister had also visited some years ago. And uh, in the uh, Dukum port, there was some uh, some offers from uh, uh, Oman. And Oman has good relations with Iran also. Uh, and uh, so we should probably, uh, two or three countries we should focus on, of which uh, Oman could be uh, one, uh, where we can have, uh, and Oman is a little different from the other uh, uh, GCC countries. So that's one country that we could perhaps uh, look at. Yes, our relationship with the UAE, et cetera, is good. But in the end, we'll have to build up uh, uh, some depth in our, uh, more depth in our relationship with uh, Saudi Arabia. And of course, we cannot uh, you know, forget Iran, uh, which is an extremely important country in uh, so many ways. Uh, and uh, uh, fortunately, uh, with Iran, our relationship is going uh, strong. But I think we should uh, uh, have some, uh, 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 you know, we have some, uh, uh, 
uh, agreements with Iran on the uh, defense side, uh, how we activate them and how we improve our uh, defense cooperation with them is also one area. So I think these are some of the, uh, uh, so the point I'm trying to make is that we must uh, uh, have deeper security uh, relationships, not simply strategic dialogues or some test ex exercises or an occasional uh, visit of a ship, et cetera. No, I think uh, uh, West Asia should become a part of our uh, uh, security perimeter. Just as in the East, we have some uh, thing going on in terms of quad, et cetera. Uh, on the uh, West also, we need to have uh, uh, these uh, stronger security relationships. And of course, why just West Asia? We have to look further because we are, uh, we have to, uh, uh, formalize uh, this or rather the framework for our security cooperation is uh, could also be Indo-Pacific and which would also include uh, beyond, which is uh, the coast of uh, uh, Africa. There are several countries uh, uh, which are very close to West Asia. But uh, so I think uh, uh, Indian Ocean, that part of the Indian Ocean, that's another area in which uh, the Gulf countries could also be a part of uh, the security architecture. And for that, We'll have to also uh, cooperate, uh, and you know, with the U.S. and with France and U.K., which are also major partners. So I think that some new thinking is required uh, in our, uh, in our security thinking is required for us to you know, deepen these uh, uh, relationships. So I'll stop here and uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. I'm sorry I joined late. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for your comments and this over excellent overview. I certainly agree with you on this point that this relationship needs to be deep rooted and needs to have a firm footing, particularly in the security domain. And we need to move beyond these very formal and perfunctory things of state level visits and delegations and all that. And this needs uh, to be more concrete and substantial. So now I invite our next panelist, Dr. K.P. Vijay Lakshmi. She is from the School of International Studies, JNU. Ma'am, over to you for your comments. Thank you. Uh, I must say that I joined the others uh, in, in offering my condolences to Ambassador Trigunayat. We will. We have missed him today, uh, but such is the way of such is the way of things. So, and I also congratulate him for literally persuading all of us to put our um, thoughts to paper, and this book is the result of that. Now, my uh, contribution has been, and I work on the United States, and many of you may know that, but uh, essentially, uh, I have been more engaged with interpreting the American influences in the region, America's motivations to be engaged in the region, and the American drivers, you know, to deconstruct all of these and put them together in order to figure out what are the major variables that influence them, and also in <clears throat> some ways to understand how the Indo-US relationship and the Indian uh, engagement with West Asia has been impacted or you know is impacting this relationship as well so in that sense i think it's a very timely book and i felt very uh, 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 honored and privileged to be asked to write some part of it now from the beginning i think i've heard all of it so it's very good to be one of the last speakers i've been i want to thank you and usana foundation to uh, ask me to speak today uh, but I must say that many of the thoughts have already come across. So let me briefly outline what I thought I might speak to you today. One is that, you know, how do you unpack the American uh, presence in West Asia? How do you look at their policy? How do you look at their, you know, how do you interpret? What, what aids us in understanding how Americans uh, do or behave in that region and around the world? You know, there's always such an interest. The first thing I'll let uh, all of you think about for a moment is Biden's latest visit, because this book was written much before the Ukrainian war, etc. But, you know, Biden has said that, uh, no, um, America is not going to walk away from, uh, you know, West Asia. Um, U.S. will remain in West Asia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, I see this as part of strategic reassurance, given certain factors that came about before that. So, you know, in that sense, I just want to put that as a peg for people to uh, keep their eye on, because this means that there is a slight shift from the previous years, like especially Obama years, and then of course Trump's own, uh, you know, engagement in the region. But I want to take you back to a kind of a 
framework which I think will help us understand. One is that to start with, you know, American presidents have been deeply involved and have made momentous decisions. So presidential decisions actually help us understand the various things that have been emphasized for the US and their policy objectives in the region. So that's one. <clears throat> the second important factor domestically has been the congressional uh, uh, divisions, their partisan fights, as well as bipartisan consensus on certain issues like Israel, and of course the many lobbies that work, and of course the uh, the US IPAC, which is very, very famous, and many other things. But you know, these are important uh, areas that help us understand why, despite so many other geopolitical things, certain things seem constant in the US policy towards uh, the Western Asian region. Now, the third important uh, framework that I mean, pointed in the framework for me was to analyze the various foreign policy objectives through the years. And that I think in the book I have said, spelt it out, but it may take too long for me to say here. But starting from communism, stopping communism to recognition of Israel and oil shock and Israeli factor and outsized role of their lobbies, Carter Doctrine and Reagan, Bush, Clinton. George Bush, Obama, Trump, and Biden. Now, if you just look at it since the World War II, uh, there has been a certain amount of uh, uh, shifts in their foreign policy objectives, whether it was oil plus communism or regional stability, whether that was more important than, you can see it in their very many documents. And then, of course, the biggest thing for the Americans, according to their own sources, has been the uh, support and enhancement or enhancing allies, especially Israel, I would say, and pushing the adversaries to corner, which has necessitated a certain type of behavior, for example, maximum pressure by Trump on Iran and, of course, different, uh, you know, uh, position by Obama. And, of course, active wars, you know, intervening in active wars, from being offshore guaranteed to becoming active. Uh, that's been a major shift as well after the 90s, especially up to, up, but by the 2000s, you see George W. Bush and his war on terror. So you have interventions in Iraq, you have Iran, Libya, Syria, so many places. So, you know, this, this whole thing is also about understanding the shifts of not just policy objectives, but behavior, linking it to the behavior of the United States and what it does. Now, the main thing that I want to focus on in all these shifts, I've outlined them, but the thing is, from Obama's time, what we were told and what we all began to worry about in a way was to uh, think about what it meant for America to resize its presence in the region and at the same time uh, promote the pivot to Asia concept. Now, that is a very critical turning point, I would say, because though it was, you know, seen as not a either or, or, you know, taking a choice between, and, you know, Abhinav mentioned that there are choices to be made. America made that choice, according to many Americans, and said that pivot to Asia is going to be the thing, et cetera, et cetera. I'll come to why I think that's also a problem for them. But the security guarantor that America was seen as, all-purpose security guarantor, and consequently a most influential outside power through defense, defense sales to Saudis, even earlier to Iran, and then UAE, has been, of course, dwarfed by its security assistance to Israel. Uh, but these... Uh, security relations, which uh, Director Gupta just now spoke about, uh, have been uh, somewhat, you know, placed both with uh, some, you know, changes, but one constant in which the U.S.-Israel relations remain as security guarantors. So Israel remains a linchpin for many of the administrations through their thing. And if you see Trump's open embrace of um, Israel, I don't have to go into details, but the normalization agreements that he uh, brokered between the Sunni Arab countries uh, was, of course, shared by them because of this aggressive Iran that they wanted to uh, see uh, controlled. But, you know, strengthening the pro-American pillars in the region, that was the idea that Trump had uh, noted because this whole resizing of American or military reticence and you know red lines in Syria etc which Obama spoke about and then his push for di diplomacy and dialogue with sanctions on Iran had really become you know in some ways a major partisan fight inside the United States because even today uh, this going back I do not know if they can go back I see some signs of again some thaw then again they're freezing but there are some essential issues which still divide them on the JCPOA but the reality is that 
you know, bringing together of the Arabs and the Jews against the Persians have created, has created through the Abraham Accords, has created um, a number of consequences. One of them is, of course, which uh, the first uh, few speakers did talk about it in a little bit. But I think uh, this particular accords had opened the way, I would say, for a number of things. One is that agitated Persians, I would say, began to now look for various ways they can influence or move things in the region. And the second was the ambitious Turks. So both these, why, how to link this uh, sudden movement? How do they appear? You know, wh what is all that? So I think that's another interesting point that we can think about. Uh, but because he brought them together, uh, the region's perception of America's dwindling influence, that was mentioned by uh, General Shukla, I think. And I think that's a very important point that you need to keep. You know, more than America saying that we are not going away, we will be there, and so on and so forth, I think there is a region's perception. I'll just come to that fourth factor. There's a three foreign policy shift. I think he has, uh, you know, begun to. Uh, see the Trump Accords begin for uh, begin a, a process of regions perceptions of America's dwindling influence in many ways and that can shape the uh, future of West Asia. Now the external variables is another interesting framework and many of you have already heard about Russia and China especially on China there's so much uh, that we heard today. Uh, the geopolitical changes especially because of the American uh, you know, focus on China as the major threat and the major foreign policy focus, uh, and it's combined with its restraint on West Asia. So I think that really has been uh, leading to the recognition of the region that there is some very important uh, uh, need to take stock of the America's waning influence. And of course, this was aided, I think, by America's botched withdrawal from Afghanistan. And I think these allies really were spooked. However, when I wrote that, I thought that was very true. And then I did see how some of the very important officials had gone there to say, we are going back to basics. We are going to learn from our mistakes. We're not going to do all that, et cetera, et cetera. So this was not going to be Obama uh, 2.0. It was going to be different, et cetera. But then, you know, the Russian-Ukraine war began. So things have changed again. I mean, the, the kind of closeness that uh, the uh, Arabs were going towards China, I think we need to take stock again and see whether that is going to hold because there is a number of things, a number of things that has, you know, in-depth involvement, both economically and in security structures. America's pressure on certain things like bases, et cetera, seems to be holding fruit. So this is, I think, very important for us to also keep in the thing. Now, uh, the undoing of JCPOA, which was touted as the biggest, uh, you know, uh, transformation or, you know, shift in U.S. foreign policy has now become, I think, uh, uh, a low point for the um, uh, 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 Arab countries because they are saying that if this new government administration, or not new, I mean, Biden administration wants to redo the JCPOA, it would mean that it is emboldening uh, Iran uh, in both uh, would see there are two problems there. See, Iran's defiance has been well documented. Everybody knows. At the same time, U.S. puts out its policy objectives in so many ways, which can be easily overturned because on the one side you have opacity, the other side you have too much of it in your face. So I think that's another problem. But uh, United States reliability as a partner after Afghanistan with, uh, the withdrawal and the uh, uh, you know uh, Houthi missile attacks on UAE, etc. All of these have given some sort of a uh, pause, I would say, uh, but whether or not the JCPOA, as I said, can come back, um, uh, you know, regional capitals um, have begun to feel that, you know, focus this exclusive focus on just uh, Iran or Tehran's uh, nuclear program has allowed Iran to advance its missile capabilities. It allows it to do Middle East adventurism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, so therefore, this has been now the song that, look, America's presence is making Middle East less secure. Now, that's a total change, I would say. Please keep your eye on that particular point because it's quite an interesting one. But the alternative directive, which I also should bring to you, is from Washington. Now, the U.S. says that this Middle East remains, for them it's the Middle East, for us it's West Asia, so those of you, uh, I'm not using them interchangeably, but I'm only quoting what they say, uh, remains a priority. And they're saying we are not deprioritizing the region, we are just 
changing it differently. And they, of course, in many documents that I've seen, they are now saying that they recognize the criticality of the region. And they are also insisting that the decade old shift of focus to Asia, primarily towards China, does not mean a disregard for the Middle East, but simply uh, need to better balance US economic and security efforts. So the region is seen as both, you know, having old problems, new problems, but intractable in many ways, which have not been resolved by the players themselves, the regional players themselves, in making certain hard choices. Some democracy issues were raised. So, you know, how to, uh, you know, uh, bring about some satisfaction to the youth bulges that dominate Arab states' populations, how to change all that. So that's all of that. So this, this particular point, I think what is seen is, uh, despite all the uh, uh, important developments, multitude of them in the last few months, uh, you have seen a hardline president emerge in Iran. Uh, you have uh, mirrored concerns with the Israeli government. You have Kurdish and federal Iraqi leaders in conflict with each other over oil and, you know, what should be done at the energy production, the economic collapse in Lebanon, lack of resolution in the conflict in Libya, Palestine continues, Houthis, etc. But uh, whether the U.S. is going to become, uh, is going to put some muscle into where its mouth is, not just money, but muscle. So that is what we have to watch out for, according to me. Uh, but there is also another frustration that I have noted that uh, the Biden officials have said, which is that for years that the region was complaining that the U.S. was intervening unnecessarily and it is too much of a presence, we don't need it, and, you know, it's not been helpful, etc. And now when Americans are, you know, saying we are going to downsize, they are complaining about it withdrawing. So this frustration is also being... Uh, observed in Washington. And, uh, but, you know, the problem is the U.S. leaders over the years have made very loud and perhaps also sometimes unnecessary, uh, you know, public statements that China is only, China is the focus of Washington going forward. So that can have its own consequences. And uh, this, this rebalancing of priorities, which they talk about, had it been effected quietly, Arab leaders would perhaps not go so far as to uh, ask for Chinese help in military equipment and technology. Uh, but, you know, th even if they did, they would not be so forward leaning as they are in many ways, in stridently announcing that they want to hedge their bets. Now, that's a big setback, I think, for the U.S. foreign policy. <clears throat> anyway, so that's one of the, uh, the things. And as I said, Biden administration has outlined three things, which are both continuous as well as some change, but mostly continuity. They have said that they embrace and they want to expand Abraham Accords. They want to end the war in Yemen and they want to potentially mediate between Jordan, Lebanon and Egypt on various energy development, etc. And of course, they're also going to, uh, you know, uh, try and do something about Iran. <clears throat> not now saying things like we are only going to do something about Iran and everything else will come second, but they want to do also something, uh, this thing. And and of course, U.S. will now not walk away from West Asia, leaving a vacuum for China, Russia or Iran, which would try to fill it. So that declaratory statement should be seen for what it's worth, because the declaratory statement has hidden behind it a number of factors which can be seen as. Uh, and of course, peace process seems to have taken a back seat. And finally, my thoughts on West Asia Accord, which is another big shift that has come out, which is that the uh, I2U2 sounds like a pop group, but actually is a very significant one, because there's so much attention given to the other Quad, but this Quad actually brings a number of things to the table. And this is something that India, I didn't want to go in too much into India because so many of the other members of today have spoken about it. Uh, but, you know, U.S. brings military prowess to the table. Uh, that's true. But, you know, in this quad, other partners are also able to make significant contributions to each other's security and economy. One is that UAE's strategic pragmatism provides a glue for the grouping while India assures you know, it is assuring India of energy supplies and employment opportunities for a vast population. India's market is very attractive. UAE also sees India as an external power uh, that balances China and is not viewed by US as a threat. So number of factors in this West Asia Accord can be unpacked very significantly with the American thinking how much it goes into it. And of course, the technological and economic muscle of the Israelis, I don't have to talk about it, and the Abraham records. And, you know, it brings uh, together economies of the Middle East, Israel and UAE, with a more assertive India and, of course, a residential external power, the United States. Uh, now, 
uh, there is nothing else I think I can really uh, think, but many th simple things that have uh, been seen in isolation need to be uh, linked through this kind of framework, I think, which would help us understand the future of the U.S. relationship with the uh, Middle East and what it's going to be. I think it's going to be how to balance um, uh, Arab states and Israel and while keeping, uh, giving them enough attention while focusing on China. It is not a static collaboration, but it would be uh, almost, I would say, yearly, monthly, even weekly adjustments, I think, would be undertaken. And I think the formulations of most of these, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, it's, it is a little difficult for Arab leaders, I would say, to imagine that their region was a bigger priority than any other one in the world, and now this is the way it is. Uh, but that has to be overcome by the United States. To do so, the Americans will probably engage much more strongly, and that you can see in the Biden uh, fist bump in the Saudi Arabia, uh, as well as his visit to Israel in July and various other things that came out because of that visit. But basically, engagement for uh, you know building more trust, reassurance uh, between US and Arab counterparts, but not just in de words, but in deeds, and of course, to include tangible provision of U.S. economic, political, security, and technological support. So this is where it's going to go. And I think India is very much a part of this story. And India-U.S. strategic partnership in many ways has animated discussions in the United States on the various things various. that we can do. So I think this is where I'd like to stop. And, uh, you know, I, I would... Uh, uh, welcome any comments that anybody has, but I think Americans are there to stay. Uh, they are now showing that uh, not only a diplomatic heft in terms of visiting the region from the topmost officials to the president himself, but they're also going to be very clear that, you know, uh, this, this meaningful hurdles that they have to overcome uh, cannot just stop with the words of strategic reassurance, which uh, Biden seems to be trying to give, but also would be uh, backed up, I think, in terms of tangible provisions on U.S. economic, political security and technological support. And I2U2, I think, would be the first major vehicle through which this you can see in days to come. But more importantly, I think uh, U.S. is... Uh, uh, position that only China, China is now shifting. It is Middle East is as important. We will we recognize its salience, etc. So I think that's where I'd like to stop. And India has a great opportunity to not only be an influencer in the policies uh, for the region, but also be a very important player and uh, important actor in uh, this geopolitical changes that the world is seeing. And India is now not just seen as a, you know, some people call it pivot state, etc. But I think it's a very fundamentally strong state that expects the world and the world expects that, you know, there will be some uh, important contributions that India can make. So India matters seems to be my uh, 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 thoughts in this particular West Asian court as well. So thank you very much, Avinav and uh, Usa. Usasna Foundation, and thank you all for listening. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vijayalakshmi, for this very wide and very you know detailed uh, overview of uh, the nuances of the U.S. interventionism and the withdrawal, and also the roller coaster ride which U.S. is going to face in the Middle East. If the uh, West Asia becomes an extension of the Indo-Pacific theater, definitely this is going to be a much more complex theater, and the engagement is also likely to be much more complex. So now I invite uh, our last panelist, uh, Dr. Kinshuk Chatterjee uh, from Calcutta University. Uh, so we are very sorry, you know, for this. You know, slightly delayed, you know, lectures and delayed presentations in, in terms of the time. Uh, but please, over to you, sir. Um, I'll uh, basically be talking about from what it seems after hearing all the panelists from the other side of the table, as it were, because I am uh, trying to talk about how Tehran looks at the, what I would consider the impending political vacuum. Uh, in the Middle East. I am in slight disagreement with the previous speaker, but then uh, I suppose we are allowed that. Uh, because uh, if, when I talk to friends and scholars all over the Middle East, what is very clear is that most observers of the Middle East today are very fidgety. You know, the Arab Spring and the resultant civil wars that is in Syria, Yemen, 
um, Libya. These have left behind votaries of stability in the region, very jittery. And coupled with that, the steady but slow and steady uh, American disengagement from the region. Uh, and this is not disputed in the region that America is disengaging. Um, the prospect of political uh, vacuum have grown substantially. All the countries in the region are, as it were, holding their breath uh, as the world's policeman is now beating the retreat. And Tehran is one of the very few capitals that seemed poised to seize the opportunity, although people there are fully aware of the many things that may go wrong in seizing that opportunity. Uh, one of the facts of life in the region, if you listen to uh, the people in the region, is that there is this long shadow of 9-11 um, as a result of which the United States is trying to reduce the footfall, the kind of footfall that it believes had triggered uh, the uh, attack of 9-11 and um, sort of won it the enmity of uh, Al-Qaeda and Islamist militants from all over the Middle East. So if you find one common thread running through Obama, Trump, and Biden presidency so far, it is that there is a mode of steady disengagement from the region. Once the, you know, the neocon misadventure came a cropper in Iraq, some Americans were actually suggesting that America should pull out immediately. And this is roughly what Trump uh, seemed to have been considering. And others have suggested that mind the exit wounds first, manage the conflict and then retreat. So Obama and Biden uh, are following a policy of set things right as far as possible so that things don't fall apart straight away and then leave. But the common point is leave. And coming of shale oil, fracking, uh, all of these have reduced American dependence on oil in the, from the Middle East in the long and medium terms, although not in the short run, as uh, Professor Vijay Lakshmi was very correctly saying. Plus the coming of electric vehicles, the options are multiplying and they are serving to reduce the quantum of American dependence uh, on the region. And the region knows that it is bracing for the end of the US security umbrella. Uh, maybe it will not happen uh, day after tomorrow, but maybe the week after that, it's surely coming. Abraham Accords, I2U2, all of these are America's attempts to get the region to engage with the possibility of that vacuum and the region's response to those attempts. Um, let's now turn to the likely rise of Tehran, uh, that, uh, that, which is the way the Iranians look at it, and the problems that may come from this. Um, you know, for the first time since the end of the um, Iraq war, the Iran-Iraq war, um, which ended in the late 1980s, Tehran is beginning to experience a lowering of the threshold of the threat potential by several notches. During 1980-89, Damascus was Iran's only ally in the region, with most Arab states supporting Iraq during the longest war. The threat perception in Tehran heightened after the discovery of Iran's weapons of mass destruction program came to light in 1991. And after 9-11, and 9-11 we see from a completely different vantage point, but when the U.S. invaded Iraq and Afghanistan, it increased Tehran's threat perception several fold because Iran had the United States on either side uh, with the American occupation of both Iraq and Afghanistan. So initially, Tehran had begun responding to uh, the neighborhood and its um, what would seem as inimical disposition in uh, Tehran. Uh, they responded propping up militant groups such as Hezbollah and Hamas functioning essentially as a second front. So whenever Tehran comes, to pre comes under pressure from the West or its allies, it opens a second front in Lebanon or in Palestine uh, and sort of tries to uh, deflect attention away from it. From 2005 to 2007, which is a period of um, high oil prices, Tehran actually even began to push back by supporting forces of opposition to the US through the creation of proxy militias. Uh, today, it seems very not natural that Iran being Shia has Shia proxy militias in Iraq. Please remember, this is the first time ever that such a thing has happened. And Tehran today is enjoying leverage in Iraqi politics 
that it has never historically had, not in the last thousand years. With Tehran's support for the Ba'athist regime in Syria, in the, in the Syrian civil war, and also clearly the Houthis in Yemen, Tehran's power is set to grow even further after the uh, instabilities created by the Arab Spring. And as almost everybody now admits, that Tehran certainly played a crucial role in the defeat of Daesh in Syria and Iraq, and that has magnified Tehran's um, power in the region. Um, Iran's choice of proxies, I should also add, is essentially tactical, not ideological. Not all Iraqi Shia accept the diktats of Tehran. The Assad regime is not Isna Ashari, it's Alavi Shia, it's a different form of Shiism. Houthis are Zaidi Shia, who are looked down upon by the Isna Ashari Iranians. They were never even counted as Shia till uh, very recently. But, you know, what began as means of thwarting US and its regional allies, such as Israel, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar, is now increasingly being used by Tehran to push its own interests actively. So it is now deploying Hezbollah in Syria, and it's having the Houthis target Saudi oil installations. Tehran could have done it itself, but that might have triggered a war. Getting it done by the Houthis was a kind of brinkmanship with slightly lower stakes. And of course, the question of the, you know, the, the deal, the, the JCPOA. So you have a shadow of a nuclear uh, capability and the deal that has been and may not be again. You know, um, Iran's nuclear program was a major headache for Iran's neighbors. From 1991 onwards, however, the Islamic Republic of Iran on this one particular question was divided right down the middle, the establishment, I mean. So though there are those who favored normalizing ties with the world, especially with the West, who wanted Iran to attain a threshold capacity, but not cross the threshold. So people like Khatemi, Rouhani, wanted Iran to develop the capacity, but not actually nuclear weapons. There were others coming from the security and paramilitary and revolutionary elites, the Islamic Republic Guards Corps and the SEPA, um, and the, the, the Basij, who wanted the nukes as a kind of insurance for sort of regime security. So people like Ahmadinejad and Raisi, they're very clear that Saddam gave up, uh, Saddam was disarmed, then he was toppled. Gaddafi was made to give up his arms and then he was toppled. Kim Jong-un sits pretty. Now, the JCPOA was clinched with the assumption that normalization of relations would strengthen the lobby that was against the actualization of the nuclear option. That is, it would strengthen the, uh, those who wanted Iran to remain a threshold power. Its critics, especially those outside, such as Pentagon, Israel, uh, members of the Pentagon, Israel, and Saudi establishment, they all say that the JCPOA merely shelved the problem for about a period of 10 years, but it does not actually solve the problem. Now, Rouhani desperately wanted to revive the deal even after, triumph, uh, even after Trump wrecked it, but he couldn't make it. Raisi is now going slow because he actually comes from that lobby that wants the nuke and that he is actually at all attending the talks or the uh, delegation is attending the talks in Geneva is because the economy is crippled by sanctions and it's a delicate balance that he has to perform right now. And all of this is happening at a time when the Middle East and geopolitical sands have begun to shift. So when Amman, Riyadh, Tel Aviv, they all complain of a Shia axis, contrary to what we take it to mean, they do not mean an ideological axis forming, simply rather that the Iranian regime is capitalizing on the governance deficit in many of these Sunni majority states or in the state, in the case of Israel, a non-Muslim um, government at all. Um, the Abraham Accords, where Israel teams up with the UAE and maybe um, Saudi Arabia would come on board shortly, was a part of this uh, new shifting sands. Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and Qatari interventions in neighborhood politics in Iraq, Syria, Sudan, and Egypt, they are all to preempt the vacuum. And as Lieutenant General Raj Shukla was talking about that, uh, you now actually have the Middle Eastern powers 
going and operating in uh, Somalia and uh, elsewhere in the Red Sea. You see, we think of it as a West Asia. They think of it as Middle East. And the Middle East is not simply West Asia. It is Middle East. Is, it also has North Africa. And from Yemen to Somalia, you are just a boat ride away. So all are vying for regional domination. And very soon, if Egypt gets a grip on its economy and Ankara gets a get rid of it on its economy, Cairo and Ankara might also join this regional domination. Tel Aviv very clearly has a single point agenda that it has to thwart Iran, which it, which it believes poses an extra existent threat. And therefore, Tel Aviv is ready to align with anyone and everyone. And in this chaos, each of the powers have tended to balance the others out. Each have been careful to avoid conflict. Have, even Israel is taking out, carrying out military strikes in Syria, but there are very calculated risks. Israeli planes haven't flown into Iran. The outcome could be completely different. So there are matters are very delicately balanced, but they may not be balanced for all time to come. So I'll just briefly wind up with one point that almost everybody seems to have touched naturally because it uh, deals with India. You know, India used to import crude oil heavily from Iran because Indian refineries were better equipped to refine the Iranian oil rather than the Arab oil. There is a difference in the quality of the crude. But the sanctions regime since 2012, as we all know, has forced India to cut back. China began to import Iranian oil in the 1980s, but it has steadily increased to import nearly a fourth of its in total oil imports from Iran. So far as Iran is concerned, New Delhi values close ties with US over Iran because you know, India cut its losses when the sanctions regime hit. Beijing, by contrast, stayed the course and it even helped Iran develop its own refinery capacity during that period of sanctions. Before that, India used to play a major part of the refinery um, business with Iran. Now, Iran has developed its own refinery capacity uh, with extensive support from Beijing. And the Sino-Iranian deal, as you know, for a period of 25 years, it promises Iran the capital it is unlikely to get from the USA, even without the sanctions regime. And in return, it seems Iran has agreed to let China build and operate port facilities even on the Persian Gulf. Now, we do not know because the terms of the deal have not been publicized, but this is one of the criticisms that a person who is otherwise not indisposed towards um, closer ties with uh, um, China, uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad says that there is a port that might actually have been earmarked for China to develop and make use of. If this is true, then it might give China an ocean denial capacity in the Persian Gulf and therefore the Arabian Sea that it does not have so far. India right now is too far behind in the race, but a section of the Tehran establishment wants India to remain on the side of Tehran, if only to counterbalance China. As the Americans say, who dares wins. We need to see whether India would dare enough to win. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chatterjee, uh, for this excellent overview of uh, what's happening in Tehran and how it impacts the, uh, the geopolitical dynamics in West Asia. Uh, we are also joined by Dr. Hussain Bakchi. He has also contributed a chapter in this book. Though we are running on a tight leash with reference to time, I would request uh, if Mr. Hussain Bakshi would like to share his thoughts. Sir, would you like to share your comments? So because uh, of this, uh, already we are running ahead of the time. So uh, I mean, I think we'll have to skip the Q&A session, but still we can take uh, two questions, not more than that. Okay? So if there are questions, please uh, raise your hand or you can just you know, read the questions, you know, anyone who wants to ask the question. And if there are no questions, then Preeti, please uh, play the audio message sent by Ambassador Tribunath. Uh, good evening, friends. Welcome to this book discussion on evolving dynamic in West Asia and India's challenges. 
to which I had the honor to contribute as well as to edit. I am indeed grateful to Abhinav Pandya and the Usanas Foundation, Vivekananda International Foundation and the Pentagon Press uh, for making it uh, possible. Uh, most importantly, I am most grateful uh, to my friends who have contributed into this, the 14 of them coming from all over the world, different parts of the world, and some of whom are present today and will be sharing their thoughts. I am, you know, that every aspect of this has been covered. This is a region which is extremely important for the world, energy supplies. It has also been contested in different manners over the years. And one is geopolitical, other is geo-religious, and the third one is geo-economic. For all these reasons, we have seen that it has been a butt of all kinds of uh, intra-regional uh, inter or global competition. And it is more so now because of the China's rise, as well as that of the, uh, the Russia-Ukraine war, which is having a direct impact. But what I am uh, feeling is that the region is understanding the dynamic in a way that it wants to not only find some kind of a modus vivendi among themselves, but also wishes to exercise its strategic autonomy, which is extremely important. And it is in this contact, context that I would like to say the region is or has been one of the most important, and if I say the most important region because of the energy security, security, diaspora security, fertilizer security, and the maritime security, and the threats it poses to India's interests, it is extremely important. I'm happy that under Prime Minister Modi, frankly, the there has been a tremendous increase in our interactions in developing those strategic partnerships into very new domains, and I hope that this continues. Today's discussion, unfortunately, I'm not there because of a family emergency, but you will hear from the best today. And these discussions, I will later on see on the recorded version, but I wish you all the very best. Do try to get this book, and I'm not uh, showing you that I'm not telling this book because I have done it. That will be useful for you. Thank you very much. So finally, we come to the end of this session, and we could have, uh, I mean, we would have loved to take more questions, but you know, we are running late. So my apologies, we, we cannot take any more questions. I mean, you know, we can take no more questions for today's session. Uh, so finally, uh, uh, while ending this session, I would like to thank all the eminent panelists who joined us today. Ambassador Anil Trigunayat for this great effort, for this great book uh, with such beautiful chapters and insightful uh, uh, discussions on the develop geopolitical developments taking place in West Asia and the impact on India. A few takeaways that, you know, in my humble opinion, which I would like to you know, gather from this discussion is that the region continues to be India's extended neighborhood, impacting India in terms of maritime connectivity, security, terrorism, counterterrorism, and certainly the historical cultural ties. The developments in the region are very wide. Uh, it began after the Arab Spring, and then you have various uh, non-state actors emerging in the region. Then the withdrawal of U.S. raises several questions. The uh, dynamics between Israel and Tehran also uh, raise a very critical uh, security dynamics in the region. China's increasing footprints also places some tough choices for India. This book covers all these wide issues, uh, including the other ones which we could not discuss because the presenters were not here, like the rise of Turkey, uh, Turkish ambitions, and the Qatar's role, etc. And this is an amazing book. Definitely, I would also request and recommend. Uh, I mean, all the scholars of IRs and uh, the fraternity uh, from the diplomats uh, to read this book. And once again, thank you very much. I would also like to thank all the participants today for joining us for this discussion and hope to see you in our future discussions. Thank you very much. Jay.